Hello everyone and welcome to our sixth big topic talk, a bonus one we squeezed in after the success of our online series um, as part of the engagement programme for the Redesigning Grosvenor Square project. My name is Catherine Gregg from Make Good and we are supporting Grosvenor in the engagement and participation side of this project, trying to do things differently and starting a far reaching conversation about the future of our urban green spaces. So welcome back to all the people who joined us previously at these events and a warm hello to people joining us for the first time today. So I'm really excited that today we're going to be discussing has the pandemic changed what we want from our green spaces? Something that I know is on all of our minds and we hope that there will be lots of food for thought. Um, looking at some of the names in the audience and the people that we know signed up, there's lots of wisdom um, and knowledge out there so please do get involved share your thoughts in the chat and help us have a really great debate so as i said this event event is part of the engagement program we're conducting um, as we consider the redesign of grosvenor square and we think there are lessons that can be learned from this process for other urban spaces and so the focus today is going to be on green spaces in general and we'll finish up by thinking about what this specifically might mean for grosvenor square so the plan for the next um, one and a half hours, if we go to the next slide, please, is that we're going to hear briefly from our speakers about how they have been um, using and appreciating their green spaces during the pandemic. And we'll be asking you as um, audience members to participate in that as well. Before we have a prologue from Councillor Matthew Green from Westminster about you know, what their immediate response to the pandemic has been. And then we're going to have a panel discussion where I would love for you as audience to participate and dig deep into these themes in more detail. So I'm delighted that we're going to be joined by five wonderful speakers who are going to help us explore tonight's questions. So if I have the next slide, please. We have, um, as I said, Councillor Matthew Green, Cabinet Member for Business and Planning at Westminster City Council. Um, then we have Daniel Raven Ellison. So Dan is an explorer, a geographer, founder of London National Park City. Daniel's work focuses on inspiring people to think in new ways about places and how to make them better. He's currently working with the National Park City Foundation to support emerging National Park cities around the world. He is hugely enthusiastic and passionate. I love that he always challenges us to think more boldly and more bravely. So it's great to have him here. Then we have Chivan Taras. Um, Shivan is the youth MP for Westminster and he's passionate about safe spaces for everybody, supporting mental health and healthy relationships, all of which we know are impacted by the quality of our green spaces. He's keen to make changes and have a positive impact to, to alleviate the struggles of his friends, family and wider community by making his local area a better place. It's wonderful to have the perspective of a young person, a group so often excluded from discussions about our public spaces. Um, then we have Carol Wright. Um, Carol is a project manager, community gardener, beekeeper, so many different titles and proud South Londoner who hails from Brixton. She's now living in Southwark. Carol dedicates herself to improving the community she lives within. She says, my family instilled in me the motto, it takes a village to raise a child. I've carried that ethos throughout my whole adult life. Carol's social media feeds have been filled with wonderful examples of growing and activism over the past months and I'm delighted that she's joining us this evening to bring that sense of reality around fostering community involvement, ownership and stewardship to this conversation. Um, we have Dr Andrew Smith, who is a reader in the School of Architecture and Cities at the University of Westminster. His research focuses on public parks and the ways they are used as venues for events and programmes activities. He's currently researching the ways events affect the inclusivity of London's parks. I've been really enjoying Andrew's commentary on social media as we see the impact on our green spaces having started to become more accessible and not presenting the pristine and sanitised view of how we as humans use our green spaces. Um, and then finally we have Emily Hamilton. Emily is Associate Director of Sustainability at Grosvenor with a track record of delivering successful environmental and social impact projects, influencing sustainability decisions at UK and global levels of business. She's a full member of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment and a Chartered Environmentalist. It's wonderful to have Emily as part of this discussion to bridge the space between being responsible to us as humans who want to access green spaces and being responsible to the planet through the ways in which we access them. So what a panel um, and an opinionated, an opinionated panel as well. So we're going to have a great discussion and I'm sure that they are going to keep me on my toes. So Let's begin. We're going to start by hearing um, each of our panel's answers to how you've used and appreciated green spaces during the pandemic. 
So Dan, I'm going to start with you and audience, please do answer as well in the chat channel. Yeah, hi, have I got some slides for this one? Yep, next slide. Brilliant. I absolutely love this image. So I live in Hanwell in West London in Ealing, not far from South Hall. Um, and this is Bunny Park, which is an absolutely glorious park, not too far from my house. And I mean, I'm one of the people behind the London National Park City. I absolutely love parks and I absolutely love exploring the city. But I think what really shifted for me during this sort of moment of crisis in our history was really sort of treating the parks as something that I enjoyed doing and not really being conscious of how critical they were to my health and well-being, to something that actually became like a really important antidote really to being isolated for long periods inside. And going to this park, to be able to enjoy this place was particularly special, special to me, not just because of how beautiful it is, but also because of its connectivity to the wider landscape. This park is on uh, the Brent River Park, it's on the Capital Ring, and actually from this particular spot, I can walk or run or cycle many kilometers and only have to cross a couple of roads. But if we go to the, the next picture, so just over from there is this, which is one of the two large golf courses that are very close to um, my house. And these spaces became like extremely important to, to me and my family when we sort of went out to explore the local neighborhood even, even more. But, but what these spaces really sort of pushed through to me, I think, was was the fact that around the border of this golf course and the neighbouring golf course, there are many people actually who don't have access, good access to, to green space, although they can look directly over it. A bit like there being an, an ocean um, of water that you're not able to, able to drink. And I'd like to sort of really challenge the idea that across our city, we actually have many socially inappropriate and unjust spaces. In this case, effectively a private park in the middle of a very dense housing area, looking the other way is some very large uh, um, areas of dense housing and then maybe we need to reconsider the flexibility the functionality and the level of access that we provide to many inhabitants that unlike me don't have a garden um, and didn't have access to even a balcony for large periods of lockdown amazing thank you dan i'm sure we're going to touch on that as we go through this this um, sense of accessibility and equality of access to our open spaces so um, Chivan, we're going to hear from you now about your, um, how, we, how you've been using your spaces differently. Um, so towards the beginning of lockdown, I, um, I wasn't really that out because obviously there was a lot of things going on. However, recently I've been going out as COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted. And the main place I've been going to is actually green spaces and parks. And it's sort of uh, been coming to me that it's, I really started to appreciate our green spaces, which I think no before lockdown. However, now that um, now that I get to like go there, and I haven't been there in such a long time, as it's quite um, I see it, I value it more, and I don't take it for granted. And yeah, it's just I appreciate it much more than I did before lockdown began. So I think that's one positive thing that did come out of lockdown quarantine. Amazing. Carol, we're going to come to you. So we're going to hear from Carol now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. So um, the thing which this lockdown has taught me is it is about the equality of access to spaces. Because if we show this slide here, it's um, from the community garden where I live and I coordinate uh, one or two um, community gardens, which is um, densely pop in a densely populated area. But not a lot of people can access this garden where this fruit and many other fruits are. There's orchards in this garden. So there's only 14 out households out of 220. And I think this garden has taught it we taught each other a lot about ourselves, about people's mental stress, people physically isolating, people not wanting to go to the park because it's so overrun with other families and because we're in the South Bank, even though tourism seemed to have slowed down because it's a high traffic area, footfall 
and um, Transport for London and about five um, over an underground station. It made people realise that we live in boxes and how important these little bits of green are. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So it's equality of access. It's the mental and physical stress that people have been under. And this is a, a lovely space built on tarmac. So literally building a, a garden out of tarmac um, seven years ago. And sort of people wanting to turn this into a playground and the opposition from people who didn't have toddlers and so don't maybe not have the understanding that we have to adapt to space, as Dan said, to fit in with the time. So, the, so it threw up more questions to be answered and how to adapt a space which is existing for one thing and making that serve other purposes and bringing people along in those conversations. So this is what COVID has taught me and that we fed a lot of people from this garden, a lot of um, fruit and vegetable went, just people started to do seed swaps, plant swaps. So it's equality, it's how you adapt very small spaces to fit um, a change. So that's, that's what I've learned and uh, happy to, to have those discussions. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited to have those discussions. Thank you, Carol. I think that is, um, that's really poignant um, and interesting that both Dan and you have picked on, up on that already. So Andrew, I'm gonna come to you now. Hello everyone. Um, hi, yeah, I mean, I've got a young family. So to be honest, we were already pretty heavy users of green space before the, the pandemic. But during the, the crisis, we definitely visited green spaces more often. And we visited a more diverse range of spaces uh, and we made use of lots of good free resources that are now available and um, to try and find like less obvious um, sort of green spaces too. Um, I suppose what changed really was that um, using green spaces became much more part of a daily routine. So I managed to replace my morning commute with a bit of a walk or a jog in the, in the park. And then in the evening, rather than traveling home on the tube, I could take my family out to uh, a local green space. And doing that was really helped by the fact that my uh, local rugby club actually provided 24, ac 24 hour access to their playing fields, which I thought, again, similar to, to what Dan was saying before, again, it was really interesting that they made, it wasn't necessarily a conventional public space, but they made that space available for local people and local families to use. Um, in terms of uh, some of the pictures here, this picture here is, is of East Greenwich Pleasant. So, I love the name Pleasance, by the way. Uh, it means uh, a place which has a sole purpose of giving pleasure to the senses, which I think is wonderful. Maybe um, Grosvenor Square could be renamed the Grosvenor Square Pleasance in its new uh, iteration. Um, it's a bit weird to spend time at a graveyard during a pandemic. So you might be wondering, oh my God, what were you doing in, a, in this space during this, this time? But it's, it's where a lot of the um, naval personnel from, from the Greenwich Hospital and, and um, yeah, and the Naval College were, were relocated. So, um, but it's a really fascinating space. It's very similar size to, to Grosvenor Square, actually, about 2.4 acres, and it's got a really diverse range of landscapes. So if you can see from the, um, the next slide, um, it's got a really nice wooded area to the, um, to the south. It's got a nice meadow area to the north. It's got a quirky sort of historic and heritage element. It's got lots of social infrastructure, some of which was open um, during the, uh, the pandemic or during the later part of the lockdown, but some of which was closed. So it's a really interesting, what I would call quite a loose green space, which isn't overly designed, but um, which offers a real range of different landscapes within a relatively small space. And this type of space, again, was uh, me and my family really appreciated the fact it stayed open throughout the, the crisis. Amazing. Thank you. Andrew, I think there's definitely like looking at the chat there's something interesting about what particular places what decisions they took in terms of maintaining access or closing off access that like you were referring to your rugby club opening up access um, and that sense of actually it's a real privilege to have a variety of green spaces that you can access and actually if you don't have a lot of green space and there's one there's just it's all focused around going to one particular green space and that puts quite a lot of pressure on it. Okay, Emily, I'm going to come to you now.
Great, thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Um, I think I've got another slide. Excellent. <laughs> so Catherine asked me to share a couple of photos of my favourite green spaces. And um, this one's actually taken in Nunhead Cemetery. Um, and Nunhead Cemetery, I live in Peckham in South East London, and Nunhead Cemetery was for several weeks my refuge. So I live in a flat. I'm very lucky. I do have access to a, a quite large balcony, but I don't have a garden. And throughout lockdown, having access somewhere that was qu quiet was really, really important to me, particularly because the local parks right, up, right opposite were absolutely full of people and because they were shutting down a lot of the other green spaces. So for an hour a day, I could go out and go and actually just connect with nature and start to feel the benefits. Um, and I took this near, uh, just at the entrance to um, Nunhead Cemetery in a really quiet spot. And for, any, for those of you who are not bird geeks like me, it's a great spotted woodpecker. They're relatively common, but they are beautiful birds. And it's just um, how you think about where you connect with nature. And Andrew mentioned the cemetery, and, and I really like the cemeteries. And I don't think in London, we make as much use of them as we could. I think they're places where people can really start to feel like they're getting lost a bit within nature. They're often slightly overgrown, a bit wild, and in Nunhead in particular, has a lot of history and heritage. And so it's quite a, it's, it's quite a peaceful place, but it's also somewhere that you feel quite respectful when you're sort of walking um, through there. And it's also got an amazing view from the top but what, but of uh, one of the hills. But what I really like about Nunhead Cemetery is that throughout lockdown, lots of new people found that it was, they were discovering that place. And I think there is an interesting question about you know, how do you respect places which are meant to be for people to go to for a quiet reflection versus the needs of what people need. And I think it's really important that we always think about the purpose of the green space. So, so throughout lockdown, I think what I've learned is that we really need to understand what the purpose is of what we're creating or what we're maintaining. And how do we, um, I guess, how do we make sure that we're giving lots of people different things? And so you're not just creating one space that is you know, just for one purpose because we, in a city, we can't really do that. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So this one is in Peckham Rye Park and it's at sunset. And um, one of the reasons why I took this photo is that after um, lockdown, once lockdown got really serious, Nunhead Cemetery was actually shut, as were all the other green spaces surrounding. So where I lived, there was actually only this park and it became incredibly busy. It was beautiful to see so many people being able to discover the park. You might not have used it as much before, um, but it was absolutely full of runners, joggers, walkers, which is amazing. But it was also at the point where the infection rate was quite high and Southwark had a very high infection rate as well. So I was quite conscious of that. So I often used to go out more in the evenings, um, particularly because I wanted just to make sure that um, it's kind of being as safe as possible. And in that like, time, it was really beautiful because it, the sunset was setting and it just gave it a completely new lease of life. And often with parks, we use them during the day, but not so much in the evenings. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about is what can we learn from the pandemic about how do we create spaces that can be used more of the year round at more times but also respect the need for nature as well. So I think my kind of key learnings are that we need more green spaces. What was very clear was that there wasn't enough in Southwark, um, although there definitely wasn't enough where we were in, in Peckham. Um, and we need more spaces that can adapt to different needs and different, and different activities, really. So I think the pandemic has taught us to respect our green spaces hopefully, 
but I think we've still got quite a lot of questions to ask about how do we make sure that we're more effective in how we can best use them. Amazing, thank you Emily. I think that's given us lots of food for thought um, and certainly resonates with my experience of green spaces. I think particularly those that are much closer to my home that I hadn't used so much in the past and actually I am now have been seeking out things that are closer and as you say Emily thinking about using them at different times of day to avoid when they might be busy so kind of earlier in the mornings I mean I've got little kids so my early morning is very early um, and later in the evenings as a as a way of kind of particularly as the days are longer as a way of kind of making sure they're not too busy so we're now going to hear from Councillor Green from Westminster about what's happening um, in that borough around this very topic what the learning's been and what the next steps might be so over to you Councillor Green um, good evening everybody I also particularly like the name Pleasant for a park um, I, I live not very far away from Emsley Horniman's Pre Pleasance um, uh, which uh, albeit just on the Kensington side of the border is uh, I think a splendid name for a park um, I, I also agree that it, it's it's that um, graveyards make for surprisingly tranquil places and it's interesting actually in Westminster how we have uh, um, actually taken over a number of former graveyards and we now administer them as part of the park service so there's the St John's Wood churchyard also in the ward that I represent of Little Venice we have uh, St Mary's Paddington Green uh, um, churchyard which is where um, which, is, which is where Sarah Siddons is buried but is now actually a, a Westminster park um, but uh, you've invited me here this evening to talk about uh, has the pandemic changed what we want from our green spaces? Um, and uh, I think the, the answer is, is, is yes and no. Um, I think like a lot of people were saying that we're, um, we're actually using the parks um, more than we did and uh, perhaps we have taken them for granted. But I think that what we want out of them is broadly the same. Um, it's just that we're appreciating them in, in different ways. Um, Westminster is lucky enough to, to boast 527 hectares of parks and green spaces, which at 24% makes up just under a quarter of our city. Um, the vast majority of European cities actually have proportions of green space well below this. Barcelona's at 11%, Paris is just nine. Um, and within that, 15 hectares of Westminster's green spaces, an area approximately equivalent to Green Park, are in and around uh, Westminster's housing estates. And I think that's very important. Um, and that figure is, is set to grow. Um, the council is embarking on large scale new uh, greening schemes for its residential developments. Um, our Church Street Master Plan envisages an increase of up to 40% in open space, and that will include a brand new park um, in the form of the Green Spine that will connect the various sections of that development. Um, we're also delivering ambitious new and enhanced green spaces as part of the Ebury Bridge renewal. Um, also, Westminster's new city plan, uh, new city plan mandates more outdoor space from our private housing provision. Um, and when that new plan is adopted, all new flats will need to offer um, at least five square metres per person of private external amenity. Um, and this external amenity is, is really important. Um, the coronavirus pandemic, um, in particular in the period of lockdown, has demonstrated both the value of open space in city centre locations and the need to provide residents with green havens in which they can find the peace and tranquility that our speakers were talking about. Westminster kept all its parks and green spaces open throughout the pandemic, and as, as a result, they were busier than ever. Um, the temporary closure of gyms and leisure centres also led to an increase in physical activity in our parks, especially during lockdown. Um, the only thing that we did close were the children's playgrounds, um, which was a sad but necessary response to the pandemic. Um, we all know that children who play outside have reduced stress levels, better moods, and improved concentration. Um, and therefore, the timetable for reopening these facilities was actually the number one issue for our residents. Um, and they were all reopened on the first day that we were allowed to do so by the government. And this was hugely appreciated, especially by those living uh, in Westminster with, with young families. Um, even before the coronavirus, parks were consistently ranked in our annual city survey as being the most important service 
uh, that was provided by Westminster City Council. Um, our park service also unfailingly had the highest level of satisfaction um, uh, rated in that same survey. And in Westminster, we're really proud of our parks. We're the current holder of the Britain in Bloom Council of the Year Award. And that was the first time we won that prestigious award in more than 20 years. So the connection that has been made between residents and open spaces provides an opportunity for Westminster and organizations like Grosvenor. Not only are we inspired to make our open spaces even more beautiful, even more welcoming, even more inclusive, but we also have an opportunity to retain some of the other environmental benefits that the corona pandemic has revealed, such as air quality. Um, and while we'll probably never be able to recreate the clean air that we enjoyed in the early days of full lockdown, we have the opportunity to dramatically decrease pollution across Westminster and other parts of London. Um, and what we're doing in West, at Westminster City Council is looking to radically reduce the number of goods vehicle trips. Um, as a council, we're working with partners like Grosvenor to improve supply chains, to expand freight consolidation and reduce servicing. We also need a single, uh, a single citywide solution for commercial waste. There are currently 65 registered waste collectors in Westminster. In cities like New York, there are only a handful. If we could reduce the number of suppliers to just two or three, we could cut, cut down on the number of refuse vehicle movements by 80%. And heavy duty vehicles such as refuse trucks are the largest contributor to, to mobile source emissions of nitrogen oxides. 16% of traffic in Westminster is actually still these heavy duty NOx polluting vehicles. Um, and we're looking at also ways we can reduce HGV deliveries by improving loading and servicing, as well as implementing a series of micro delivery hubs across Westminster. By using satellite distribution centers, which deliver freight over the last mile using electric or low emissions vehicles, we could reduce the amount of carbon produced per kilo of freight by up to half. And last year, Westminster declared a climate emergency, and we have that objective uh, of, of reducing carbon in, across our city by 2040. Um, and as Westminster begins to recover from the pandemic and we start slowly to resume our lives as they were before COVID hit or, or an approximation of them, we need to look at those silver linings of the coronavirus cloud and find ways such as improving our, our green spaces, such as ensuring that we have a high level of air quality um, taking these opportunities and delivering an a lasting environmental legacy for our residents. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Councillor. I think, you know, definitely there is going to be um, something that we talk about, I'm sure, later in terms of um, that green spine. I, I, as you said, it, I thought I'm sure Dan's got something to say about kind of linking green spaces and creating that network of green spaces, but also the air quality piece. I think it's been really interesting as we've been running workshops and activities with um, people throughout throughout lockdown on this project. We've really found people talking about the, that palpable difference in the air quality. So and we're now going to invite back all of our panelists um, for a discussion and we're going to talk about three key areas um, and as we shift between the areas I'll be asking you as audience to add in your thoughts. So the first um, topic is going to be distanced communal activity. Second one is going to be encouraging an active low carbon lifestyle which definitely touches on that air quality point. And the third is about connection to nature, promoting well-being and greater appreciation of nature. I think, you know, this is the thing which almost all of you have talked about, and I'm sure we've all talked about it in our own lives, um, about the impact and the, the just noticing how much better we have felt from having access to green spaces. But I think Dan and Carol's point is going to be really important about the equality of that access. So we're going to bring all the speakers on and then we will start our discussion. Amazing. So, um, you know, the, the topic this evening is, has the pandemic changed what we want from our green spaces? And I think there's been this really interesting piece of research that I found from CPRE that was, and they ran a poll back in May. 
and found all these like wonderful statistics about you know 35 percent of people reported visiting green spaces more since the start of lockdown 53 percent of people said they appreciate local green spaces more since uk adopted social distancing measures 57% of people reported that lockdown has made them more aware of the importance of local green spaces and 63% of people think protecting and enhancing green spaces should be higher priority after the lockdown. And it's, you know, it's interesting to see how that actually translates in our, our human behaviour. But, you know, Dan, Carol, you touched on this like in your earlier slides about, you know, this unsaid topic around the disadvantage of being able to access green spaces. And so, actually a recent article in the British Medical Journal talked about people who are confined to their homes um, and the impact or don't have access to a green space or don't have their own outdoor space because you could live in an area where um, actually you come out and you're, you'd have to walk quite far to access a green space so that has a huge physical and mental health impact and it's disproportionately impacting on people from disadvantaged communities so you know, also, Andrew, I know that you were in this talk that we had the big puppet talk on healthy places with um, Harmony Ridgely from Public Health England. And she talked about this 120 minutes per week of being a really key factor that it has such a positive health impact. If we're outside in green spaces for that amount of time. So, Carol, I just wanted to come back to you on this kind of how we link that, you know, how do we start to address that quality uh, or equality of access? to green spaces? You know, are we being bold enough? I think probably not. I think, um, I don't think, I think it actually starts with school because children, it's got to start from childhood. Because the access that I had to nature as a child, growing up in the 80s, compared to what my young relatives have, is, is greatly reduced. Because if they go outside of the house, if they've been outside of the house during this pandemic, it's a miracle. And I've seen this reflected across the estate where I live, when I've seen, and it was mainly on Sundays, where, um, where parents forced their, their children out of the house. So they said, it's too much now, you've been in, and you've been chatting to your mates on whatever console you've been playing, you've been doing the lots of school homework. And they would go off and take them down the Thames Park. And I was shocked to see them. I was shocked to see 15-year-olds going out with their younger siblings, um, brothers and sisters, going and having a walk. because they want, and, and they were choosing the evening because it was less crowded. So there was this kind of code of use of the outdoors, which was going on, where you'd get the joggers and the cyclists. And, you'd get, and, and I'm just going to say it for it is. You'd get the white middle class people rock up off of my estate first in the morning with the lycra. You had the lycra posse go out first with their bikes and that, the Bromptons and all this. And then the afternoon, you might get the youth congregating near the closed basketball court because that was another major factor. The playground and the basketball court got closed down and they could only access the outside gym. And nobody wanted to go and use the outdoor gym. Really, they didn't. And then you got the older ones with their parents going at but you know so yeah it was very interesting how um, the green spaces off of the estate got used and people would jog around the locked playground they would rather jog in what is designated a road than go up to Geraldine Mary Harmsworth Park, Ufford Street Park, Kennington Park or mm. further Burgess would be a bit too far I would venture further so it has to start younger so I, we really have to look at when people, when RHS says, you know, these RHS Britain campaigns and get you out gardening and eating veg. I'm wondering who, who they're really looking at. Yeah. Because some of them kids there, they weren't, they really not interested in doing the, the communal gardening and the Joe Wicks exercise sessions. And, they, and, they, and it's also about safety because I, I think Emily was talking about later in the day, but you have real turf wars here. So you're very conscious of going from one part of SE1 to the other. So there's all these factors which limit access, but it starts younger, you know, and I'm totally on the same page as that. You've got to start people younger and looking yeah. in costumes and looking on, because there's a lot of, I don't want to take it's nasty in it. So we have a lot of this and I've had youth in the garden with me and other residents and the parents are like shocked to see that they're actually helping in the garden. 
and that's a, a resource which has been cut back in school. So we really do have to support what goes on in schools because that supports the generations coming up. It really does. So they don't think nature's for them if it's not started young enough, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna come I'm gonna come to Chiban actually on this, but I think there's definitely something interesting, like we talk about quite a lot in our work around those emotional barriers, because actually, you know, we talk with you know, we it's really easy to fixate on kind of what are the physical access barriers or or proximity to somewhere that's green. But what you're talking about is something that's more about an emotional, like non-physical barrier of that space isn't for me, or I don't want to go outside because of whatever those reasons are. So um Chibani, I'm just wondering whether whether that resonates with you and what you think, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm wondering what the role of green spaces is in terms of like particularly as a space to socialise for young people. Um, I think that like the idea of staying in, like people staying in a lot, like I'm playing consoles and doing things like that, and not really going outside. I think that's happened a lot, but once do you start going out age and go to green spaces and go have fun with their friends, I think they eventually begin to sort of do it more often and they begin to like it more, which is what has locked down, like, locked down taught a lot to people, especially my age and my friends. Like we started when we could, like when we finally had the chance, we were going out to the park a lot more often, like when um, it was open, when we used to not really go to the park and now we really appreciate it more. And I think once you sort of start Green spaces, I think, have been really used for young people, and young people do, and are starting to, especially at this certain time, are beginning to appreciate it more and more, and it's helping them out. Not only physically to have fun, but even when you're alone sometimes, as you're saying, emotionally. Like, if, if I'm having a hard time out myself, and I know friends that will go have a walk, go sit in a park, and just, you know, chill out, and, um, yeah, and relax with it. Yeah, it's, an, it's interesting. So Dan, I'm wondering whether about this kind of pressure on green spaces, like the premise of the National Park City and this network, um, and as um, Councillor Green talked about, this green spine, whether that is a mechanism through which you could um, take some of the pressure away from some of the spatial constraints, do you think? I'd actually like to flip the argument on its head slightly. Um, <laughs> Dan does that. I mean, <laughs> for me, Covid has almost been like I remember in primary school eating those sort of um, those tablets that make your teeth stain bright purple when you haven't cleaned your teeth properly, and it's almost like Covid has done that to a whole range of sort of social and health sort of inequality issues, right? So there's always been a deep inequality in the way that benefits work, that health uh, um, the health inequalities exist, the spatial inequalities that exist in our city, and it's almost like this sort of pill was just posited on, on the city and a lot of these things became far more inflamed to us in terms of these issues. And actually, I think the bigger problem is that people weren't using parks nearly enough before this crisis. And in the most case, people weren't using them enough during the crisis either. Our photography uh, that we saw in the media, our public imaginations were focused on these very small squares in parts of Hackney and Southwark where there was very great pressure. But right across London, there are very many communities with big expanses of football pitches and rugby pitches that you could quite happily populate with far more people. So I'd like to sort of build on what Emily said earlier about, you know, rightly saying we need more parks and more ambitious parks. And I wonder whether every borough could uh, identify a golf course which would benefit the community the most by liberating it to being a public common. Um, we want better parks, better quality, but we actually want more people in them as well. And the, the point I'd make here is, just really about being more inviting. And the fact that actually quite often we intentionally design these spaces to not be inviting. And the place that I saw most inviting in my bunny park nearby was bandstands, right? And I think the bandstands are one of these things that are one of the most neglected parts of beautiful, you know, pleasant, uh, pleasure giving infrastructure. Not only were they one of the few places where teenagers could gather away from their parents on cold days and rainy days while still outdoors, but actually these could be incredible venues for people to talk, to sing, to make music, to give poetry, to do art, to bring people together, to invite them into the spaces. And I just think that across our parks in London, we could be doing far more to invite people in a welcoming way in. And for those activators, those performers, those provocateurs to reflect the communities that are currently absent from our parks, which to be yeah. honest, nearly every community apart from white men. So we need more people. That's the problem. I think not necessarily that there's a few parks with too many. Yeah. 
I'm now going to, I'm going to, I loved that, but I'm also now going to go to a white man because I wanted to ask Andrew about your, your research, because I know your research at the moment is around kind of the impact on equality that kind of events or programming. And I think, you know, I just so often see or hear the, the conversation about being inviting, being linked to activity, that that is, you know, I've got to have an activity and invite people to it. And that is what makes a space inviting and kind of if you could talk a little bit about how your research might um as dan says flip that on its head yeah i mean it's i think events and programmed activities can be a way of um, making parks more inclusive if you know depending on what type of event you're talking about i mean one thing it can do is actually allow certain um i don't know religious and, and ethnic minorities to feel visibly represented in parks if you've got lots of festivals and events which are dedicated to particular community groups or particular um, ethnic identity, particular religious, religious identities, that not only encourages those people into park, but actually it makes a statement that these parks are very much, you know, these, you know, the, 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 those people are visible and, and they, they're represented in the park. So, I mean, at the moment, obviously, there haven't been those sort of formal events and activities. So I suppose we're quite interested in the moment about what has happened instead. And there's lots of informal activities and more spontaneous things happening. So I noticed someone in the chat chat was talking about what she liked about Burgess Park was the fact that there was all these sort of um, slack line walkers and lots of sort of impromptu activities so one thing that we found so far is definitely that it's not just about events but actually programmed activities and clubs and allowing community groups access to green spaces to stage their own events getting them involved in the organization of events and that process of involvement and engagement can be as important as the event itself so I think going forward, that's something that we could yeah. make easier to do is make sure that um, sort of community groups, local groups aren't faced with a sort of barrage of bureaucracy to try and organise their own events. Uh, and they're not necessarily just having to consume events that other people think they should be consuming. They're actually involved in planning and organising their own occasions. So, Carol, I know that one of your hats is as kind of community garden manager. And have you been have you been back out doing that in a socially distanced way i think i've seen on social media that you might have been and just how's that how has that been impacted it's um, never stopped there hasn't really been a break um in gardening in delivering um just being there just being outside um after a little after just working out what this lockdown was about then going checking out Burgess Park because going anywhere near nine hours was shocking. And it was um, people wanting to grow things on their windowsills. We haven't got balcony space on the many um, estates around here. And furthermore, we were getting information that people passing away. So we knew that COVID deaths were happening around us because we are in a transport hub. So it hasn't stopped. And, and I think the most successful co community event that I've had on the... Um, in this area in about five years was actually the spring clean just called a spring clean people came with their masks and all their sort of kind of alcohol alcohol hands wash and people came out I, I would say the majority of the plot holders in one garden came out to meet their neighbors to see who was there because they've never had time to see who actually is growing things beside them. So they came out and it's that, let's come, let's see who's there, let's, um, let's tidy this space. And I think this, the, one of the gardens, Blackfriars Peabody is looking the best it's ever looked because people have had more time to see each other and understand the privilege of being one of a, a set of a few people on the big housing estate to have access to that space have access to each other. There's like a WhatsApp group and other people have been coming to see, to talk to them, to swap tomato plants, the local councillors have been as well, and just giving each other ideas and permission because I'm, I'm hearing about people feeling that the outside is for them as well. Um, and I know Andrew was saying, and I think we have to, and Dan touched on it, there's a, there's a lack of spontaneity because when I was a youth, I could take my trumpet because I played the trumpet and go and play it in the park, and nobody was telling me about ASB. <laughs> <laughs> I 
to change that up. You know, you'd get a pedal powered sound system. I'm all about a pedal powered sound system and a drum and bass. And, and I've, I've been cheeky with the residents and we've had sound systems on housing estates and things like that. I'd love to do it again. It is coming. Um, and it's all of that. It's people telling you what you can't do. Mm. And then that's ingrained and that's passed down. So with my generation, we're like, yeah, let's chant down Babylon in it. We're going to take our get our blaster all day in Kennet and Park because there's the Lido. And that's the other thing. So many bits have gone. Like you could go swimming in Geraldine Mary Harmsworth Park, Kennet and Park. And all of that, you know, there was, you know, some rowdy people would like chuck you fully closed in. Um, but you could, you had so much more. And the bandstand, those were things. You could just rock up and play some tunage there. The barbecue, you know, you have to have a little conversation about the barbecue. That was locked off in Burgess anyway. But it's also, there's something which kind of irks me. I'm going to use that word. I don't think as a person of colour, BLPOC, whatever, that we should only think the park is for us if they've got Diwali or something. I think that's no, a bit true. Rank. It's rank. Hello. You know, why? You know, why, why can't, what can't black and people of colours be the landscape designers? The no, I agree, I agree with that. The bungee jumpers. Yeah, I've got to pull you up on that. Because if someone's telling me come go to, you know, any event that's really connected to religion, because that's the time I should access a park, I'm looking for the argument. I'm, I'm encouraging people to challenge what the parks mean to different communities that live on the doorstep, because it was very apparent, in my personal opinion, who felt the freedom to access the green spaces during this lockdown and who felt excluded. So I'm about, sometimes you've got to let it, you know, and I've never seen so many Section 65. I never even knew what that was until Burgess to have on Sandwich Board, the enforced Section 65. If we dare to see you of a miraculous, you could end up in the nick. It's like, yeah. don't make any noise other than going past with your expensive bike or just walking around. And they have loud hailers and the police van. I bet they'd have had that in Dulwich. In Burgess Park, they had police vans shouting at you not to lie down on the grass. I thought, this is George Orwell now, isn't it? It is. I think, I mean, it, your experience, Carol, is like definitely echoed across. You know, I think there was that whole moment in, in lockdown yeah. that felt like the policing of, of kind of how we can behave in public was really challenging. Yeah. But I think that there's definitely three things that seem to be coming out of that. One is about the amount of green space needing to increase and mm. the, the kind of how inviting it is. And then that kind of programming of it being something that is not determined by a really small group of people um, that it's kind of much more inclusive. So, yeah, I mean, Carol's, uh, sorry, Carol's point about the rules is really important because we associate certainly parks the sort of formal municipal parks we're having very strict rules and yeah. being told and actually i think that is a problem and if we're looking for sort of looser green spaces not only in terms of their design but actually in terms of their management and how they're regulated and i think there is a need to be a bit more tolerant of different peoples and different communities what they want to do in parks and actually sort of not making everything requires permission you need a license to do that you need sort of you know various permissions to do that and it's a difficult balance because we need some regulation and management but I think there is some some really interesting work to be done on how we regulate these spaces. It's I agree with that. Group. It's who constitutes the friends of group and that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> that's a yeah. whole nother big talk by itself. Who's yeah. on these friends of group? I leave yeah. it, I'm parking it there people. All right. Yeah, but can I also say that, that I, I, I've, I've written a bit about this and I think that friends groups are castigated for their whiteness and their middle classness. But actually, these groups are the reason we still have many of London's parks. And actually, they can be very easily dismissed because of their lack of diversity. But actually, there's a considerable number of parks in London that would not be here today without the support of these local groups who've dedicated time, effort to actually campaign on their behalf. And they shouldn't be dismissed because they're white and middle class. They're actually playing playing an extremely important role in the management of these parts. I'm so, gonna I'm gonna move us I'm gonna move us on to oh, access because we're I'm gonna, more, I'm gonna write about there. that. You can come back to it Carol. Like, I am gonna come got, back to that. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, we've got a couple more topics. So thinking around kind of this access point which we've we've kind of touched upon and I think you know there's a lovely quote from journalist Gabby Hinsliff about um, whether it 
when this is over, people want more, not less of the lungs that help cities breathe. And that kind of connects that thing that we're talking about, about the volume of green space. And so there's a question that's come in, Emily, about kind of these, the role of things like parklets and how you can create kind of smaller green spaces that might, as I said, kind of extend that green offering. I think that's really important. Um, especially in more built up areas. So where, where Grosvenor's estate is in Mayfair and Belgravia, it's a West End, it's at the heart of, of, of London. It's incredibly busy. And whilst we've got aims and ambitions to have more pedestrians, more cyclists, and for it to be a lot friendlier and more inviting, we do have a lot of traffic and you can't get away from that. And you're also next to Oxford Street that has very poor air quality. So the almost the pocket parks and the hanging baskets and all these little tiny things that on their own might mean nothing. Once you actually start to add them up, you're putting like a green lamppost in every single street, you really start to create this sense that you can have green stepping stones. And then if you can add in, you know, green roofs, um, purposeful, like sustainable urban drainage, then you start to feel like actually you may be in the heart of a city, but as Dan and others, you're in, an, you know, in a national park city. You're somewhere which does help you feel connected to nature, even if you're in the heart of it. But more importantly, nature's having a function that's supporting community activity as well. One of the things I really like about lockdown is that you're now seeing a lot more cafes putting their tables and chairs outside. Um, and that wasn't necessarily happening before. And with that, they're then putting more planters and people are finding ways to put planters as almost separate out between the roads and the streets and so suddenly we're starting to use green infrastructure as ways to um help way i guess more way find the the public realm and to way find people to be able to know where to go to be able to know you know this is somewhere you're invited to sit um so i think green stepping stones can be really important i do agree with carol though about the spontaneity point i would love to see us being more spont spontaneous what I love about guerrilla gardening is when you go out and you just see people, you know, planted stuff. And, and we did a bit on that of our, with our gardeners on the estate for a while. We went out and did a bit of guerrilla gardening. And I think it's just trying to empower people more because green space budgets are not what they should be. Green infrastructure isn't seen to be part of infrastructure at the moment. It needs to be. It's not given the same funding as roads, rails, all that type of stuff. So I think you need to rely on more and more people wanting to get involved to help stimulate the, the reasons why we need to have more funding and how we bring communities together. So I think green spaces and these pocket parks have an absolutely fundamental role. Uh, Catherine, if I can come in on pocket yeah. parks, not least because they're usually two of my least favourite words. Um, uh, um, not normally because they, they come in, uh, I'm in charge of planning in the council and they come in the context of something that a developer has proposed and is trying to convince me that some form of glorified window box is, a, is in fact a pocket park. I'm not talking about Grosvenor here, of course. I mean, they do. Um, I've seen the plans for, for one of Grosvenor's developments. It looks like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon at the uh, Cundy Street estate that they're proposing. But I think that we, we do pay, sometimes we do, that we, we have all these words now about like park, uh, pocket parks, parklets, and it, we don't really embrace the nature around us. We, we kind of pay lip service to it. We will just put, a developer will put up a large concrete building and uh, dedicate a very small corner of it to a, to a bit of greenery. Um, and it, it's, it's not in, in any way ambitious. And I think that we have to be careful sometimes about, the, about these pocket parks and make sure that, they, um, that, that they're genuine, that they're, they're not just um, a nod in the direction of, uh, of greening. We really need to integrate um, uh, um, greening into, into all, uh, especially housing, housing development. Certainly, in, uh, as I was talking about Westminster's housing stock, um, the greening of those areas, you know, so I don't know if anybody's been to the Churchill Gardens estate uh, in Pimlico, but the nature of the, uh, I mean, the name itself should give it away, and that, that actually the, the landscaping of that housing estate was designed by the, by the head gardener from Kew. 
Um, and I think that the, to, that's the kind of level of ambition that we should be looking at in our housing developments, not just saying, let's have, let's have a pocket park, which is essentially a tiny piece of green that, that is not going to benef benefit anybody. It really needs to be, to be mainstream. We need, a, we, we need a trouser park or a shirt park, not just a pocket park. Yeah, I think that scale, I mean, maybe there's something in between uh, or like a combination of what Emily's talking about around those green stepping stones, mm -hmm. but not as a way of saying we don't need these bigger spaces. No, I, as I said, not Grosvenor, not Emily, but I think that some developers will just yeah. talk about the pocket park and essentially will, will say to themselves, greenery ticked. Um, and actually, it, it's, it's, it's an afterthought and it's not integrating it into the very heart of development. Yeah. I mean, Chivan, I know you're going to need to turn your microphone on, but it would be it'd be interesting to know kind of as you're listening to this conversation, you know, whether like how this relates to how, um, you know, I guess, you know, that the sense of those smaller pieces of space linked to kind of bigger spaces and the way that as a young person you're navigating our cities and using your green spaces. Is he there? lost him i'm gonna i'll come back to him so maybe dan you can come in on that point on the way of like of networking these small spaces yeah i think like if there's one fact that really astounds me about this city and maybe our spatial imagination of the city is the fact we give over more space to roads than we do to houses and that actually car parking takes up about half the amount of space that we also give to houses which when we consider the level of wastage and inefficiency, the level of disruption to childhoods that cars have on our, on our lives, I think is completely unacceptable and completely illogical for a city as developed as ours. But just the fact that so much of the space outside my Victorian terrace here is occupied by empty private cars that aren't used most of the time. I think it's a great, great shame. But I do think that it's important to recognize that, that Park, I really like quality when they think about parks in Latin America, right? So parks won't necessarily be green all the time. Sometimes a park space or a recreational space that's outdoors, it's better if it's a hard surface. If you are um, from a poor background, you've got one set of clothes and it's winter time, then you don't want to be on the grass and the grass will get messed up anyway. You want a hard surface. And there are many street spaces where actually a hard surface is just more appropriate. You just think about the way that Soho was taken over um, um, recently. But what I'd say is this, just as a sort of takeaway. I've walked across all the cities in the UK and these spaces that I find most inspiring, most exciting, most beautiful are the dismantled railway lines that have become the, some of the longest linear parks in the country. And these long railway lines are great for cyclists and walkers. They're quite often actually very spontaneous spaces where all kinds of strange things can happen because they tend to be policed and governed in a far more flexible way. They're great for pollinators. There's all kinds of reasons why they are super multifunctional, beautiful. And there is a future where if we reimagine this nearly 12% of London that is roads. If we reimagine having parkways, I think that word has already been used poorly elsewhere, having parkways, green roads going through our cities, just in the same way that we see in places like Aberdeen and Bristol and Bath, where we've got these dismantled railway lines, we can achieve the same for some of our roads in London. I think that would be truly beautiful and extraordinary. And maybe it's something that Westminster could, uh, you know, really achieve. I mean, I definitely think, you know, there's, I want to move us on to this question around, like, what do we do? What can we do with that momentum that we seem to all be feeling around this greater appreciation of nature? And I think, you know, there's been a mixed response of this outpouring of love for our green spaces and then like some kind of disappointment that somehow they're flooded with people because, as you say, there isn't enough of it. So then it feels people kind of think it's being used too much and there's lots of litter. Um, and I was reading this really interesting article um, on the conversation by Zita Zepasvari, so from the United Nations University. I'm really sorry, Andrew, I knew that you'd be like, that is the worst woefully unacademic referencing of something. But yeah, it's, no. it's Sounds also good. human interaction with nature and ecosystems. And basically, because we don't have that, one of the, re one of the reasons why we can have, why we have this current pandemic is, you know, we're not 
so connected with nature and the ecosystems are one important driver for the emergence of these diseases is like this kind of biodiversity loss so what are we doing to kind of really promote biodiversity um you know that on the other hand can then reduce the risk to human health and i think you know, it's really interesting to think about you know what when we talk about green space what the qualities of it are like are we imagining it as a lawn or and what the biodiversity yeah. of needs to be no that's really interesting i think um I suppose like if we're having this conversation 20, 30 years ago, we might be talking about how to make parks more sociable and think about entertainment and adding sort of those types of activities. But now we're much more talking about them as spaces for nature and for wildlife and flora and fauna. And I suppose anecdotally, one of the things that was interesting about lockdown was this idea that parks were stripped bare of their cafes and some of their um, sports facilities, commercial installations, playgrounds, and actually people who went there were probably more engaged with just the nature that was there and, and, them, and them as sort of natural green spaces. So again, I don't know if we've got really hard evidence for that yet, but there's this idea that maybe people, I don't know, had a bit more time, but also there were less distractions, less organised fun happening, and therefore people were almost um, more appreciative of nature, maybe more observant of nature, and that might actually be a positive thing that we could capture going forward. Um, I think the danger with all these things about lockdown is that the situation is changing rapidly and we're sort of slowly returning to the, the status quo, what, you know, the, the pre-existing situation. So I think it's really important to try and capture some of this and try and, mm. for example, reminding government how important parks were and sort of making sure that that statement is made clearly because in a few months time, you know, this sort of the message might be a little bit more diluted and it's less of a sort of prominent issue. So I think it's really important to try and capture some of the things that happened in this period and use them to try and lobby for for better, more funding, for more generous parks provision. I mean, before the pandemic, the government was suggesting their main strategy was 13 million pounds for a series of pocket parks, which now seems completely inadequate. Well, it seemed at the time, but it now seems even more inadequate. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cass, could I just come in on parking? Um, uh, I, I think that one of the, the and it's not, it's not strictly about parks, but it's about shared spaces. One of the things that we've done um, in Westminster is because the hospitality industry is so important uh, in the city, we have 80,000 jobs that, that depend on it. We've done um, a lot of uh, time pedestrianisation of certain streets, especially in, in Soho and Covent Garden. But in those areas where we haven't had pedestrianisation, we've actually been converting the parking spaces into areas that restaurants can then put outdoor tables and chairs in those spaces. So I think that this demand for out, this demand for outdoor space, be it partly because um, uh, pe uh, within within uh, the premises of restaurants that they, they they can't serve as many people as they used to, but also the feeling of security that people now have from being outdoors has meant has has, ha has led to. What, what we're doing, albeit on a temporary basis, this, this kind of natural conversion of what was what was um, previously space for 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 vehicles, as to becoming pedestrian spaces, uh, al fresco dining, um, giving the the, the 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 opportunity for people to to kind of gather together um, in the spaces that have been all, that have been vacated by cars, because in spite of the virus, we're incredibly social and we we want these these opportunities. To, to come together, and I've been I've been incredibly impressed by the way that the, the outdoor dining is working in, in areas like Soho and Covent Garden. Also, there's parts of Marylebone as well that they're doing it, and um, obviously all in a, in, a, in a suitably socially distanced way. But it, it really that the atmosphere has completely changed. It, it, it does not feel like like central London anymore. It feels as it, um, and and for those people who are not able to to go on holiday this year, then I invite you to come to Soho and Covent Garden for that continental al fresco feel because I I really didn't think it was going to happen, but I was surprised at the way that that uh, we that, that people have filled those uh, the, those spaces, those spaces that are normally reserved for cars. Yeah, and I know that Carol, I saw kind of further back in the chat, you put something about play as well, kind of using the streets mm. to play. You know, I'm wondering, you know, it seems like to me, I feel like there's two sets of conversations that I'm witnessing, not in, not in this talk, but just generally in life, which is one people talking about like, you know, low carbon lifestyles and green networks and biodiversity and play on our streets. And then there's the reality of people's behavior 
So I'm just wondering, like, I don't know, Carol, if you, how you think it might work in reality to like, whether the scale of shift is, is kind of incremental. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, definitely, because um, it depends what you've got access to, really. It really does depend on um, what space is, because um, closing the street, you can't close Blackfriars Road, it's hell to pay. You know, any time they have an arts event on Blackfriars Road and it gets closed, there's a whole heap of argument from Transport for London and suburb planning team. They go into overdrive. On, on they more say why you can't do it rather than encouraging you to do it so there has to be the political will you know our local councillors and our local mp neil coyle have to get behind it and stop hiding in rotherhive you have to come down and you have to come down on the side of the people because you have to see who's impacted by the cars and, who, and the asthma rate and everything like that you know because people want their children to go out and play i'm fortunate that where I am, there is a Victorian square and they're just run, running around and to see the parents come down and playing with their children. And then when it got to about week number six, people were just going over the railings into the playground. Mm. It was as simple as that they need and they needed to see each other. And it's that connection. It is that so as um, councillor said there, we are social beings for people yeah. want to go out and play and it's kind of almost like you have to have play clinic on some of these estates like to remind people of what it is to play and that's not just children that's adults that's adults let's get out let's get the cricket back whatever we want to get out bull don't care Yenga, try it Yenga. let's have it you yeah. know so it's all of that people want to play i just think they should just close a lot of these estates and the adjacent streets and let's just have a whole weekend of play Oh, and hot scotch and and then we last rubber band things you know and and then we can talk about obesity yeah the government can fund us yeah. for their obesity initiative and just give us whole weekends playing we've got inline skates and i'm not even joking we should yeah. just be encouraged to play and, and and yeah, yeah, mini mini anecdote just before I come to you, Chiron. But my mm -hmm. um, my four year old da daughter got really confident on riding her bike during lockdown and can now mm -hmm. like cycle to the forest about fifteen minutes away, kind of on her bike. And it's really interesting that I went from being like stay away from the road, stay on the pavement, like being really nervous about her cycling, to actually thinking there aren't any cars. Like she's okay <laughs> to to cycle. And it's been really empowering for her, and she's super excited that she can travel under her own steam and she's yet to damage anybody's car so i'm uh yeah, we have skateboarders lots of skateboarders yeah. down in the road up on that division bit and that's yeah. what we wanted and, and we were back in richard reynolds the gorilla garden who used to live up the road we wanted all those central concrete bits to be planted up and i think there's still an argument for that to happen but definitely close down places let's have the play yeah really. mm -hmm. i guess you know really thinking about what is the what are the types of places we want to create are we do we really want it to be dominated by car not really so just before we kind of come on to our final question um chivan you were saying before about um how you and your friends have started to use parks a little bit more now and i'm wondering what you think would be the route to that continuing or do you think it just will now that you've it's now you've started to use them to be honest i think it will gradually continue but it could be done like if there could be stuff to speed it up and encourage it more often which is what um is sort of encouraging play more and sort of encouraging much more things that can include um include playing including things like cycling football basketball just more activities and that will get people especially my age especially for young people it will get them more outside and like the idea of um you know sort of playing and i think the idea of having more sort of green spaces and areas that aren't really car dominated is, is a really good way to sort of do that. Amazing, thank you. Okay, so um, we've had an amazing, really lively debate there. Um, I just want to ask, I'm going to come to each of the panellists and I'm going to ask the audience as well, if you can answer in the chat channel, like what you think, what the key lesson from the, this discussion might be for Grosvenor Square as we're thinking about its future. So, where shall I go first? 
Uh, Dan, I'm going to come to you. I think uh, a thought that keeps coming back to me as a reflection from the whole COVID crisis, and like I say, it's sort of really making maybe this even more clear, is that that you know we often think of the importance of the NHS and how important the NHS is to our lives. And we know that fundamentally what the NHS is, is it's about illness. We get sick, we go to the NHS. And what we really need to have is institutions and places that are as well funded, right? That are as well prized, that focus on our well-being. And actually the places that do that most are leisure centers and they are parks. And for the most part, actually, they're not properly funded or activated or protected. They're not big enough. They're not necessarily in the right places. They're not necessarily being um, inviting enough to enough people or necessarily the kinds of people who would benefit most from them. So I think the Grosvenor Square could be thinking about how it can connect physically more through the landscape, ex expand its tentacles through the streets, occupy as much of that part of London as possible. So reach as many people as possible, reaching out that hand and inviting people in, but also then having things in that place which are super multifunctional, super inviting, that people can enjoy and they feel welcome to be there. And actually sometimes that means maybe about standing up to people who are culturally snobbish about the kinds of activities that should be taking place in those kinds of places and use the might of your organization to protect some of those people in those spaces and provide them the space to be well and healthy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Green, I'm gonna to come to you. You need to unmute yourself. I think, that I, th I think the first thing I'd say is it needs to be um, uh, open. Um, uh, and I know that seems that, that seems a rather obvious thing to do is to say, but um, it was only when I was um, I was on holiday in Scotland last year, and I was in Glasgow, and I, I'm I'm a dog owner, which makes me more of a park user than most. Um, and I was trying to take my dog to do the things that dogs tend to do um, uh, through the streets of Glasgow, and I discovered that the, the vast majority of the of the of the, of the squares, the so-called public squares in Glasgow, are actually all um, uh, um, fenced off. Uh, and locked and gated for uses that are used by residents. And uh, so I think that the, the great thing about Grosvenor Square is one, it's, it's one of our great public squares. Um, and, we have to, and we have to keep it open. And when I say open, I don't just mean so that I can take my dog to do what the dog needs to do, but just to, just to, to, to extend that concept of openness. To, to make it really welcoming to uh, not only to the people in the in the in the nearby vicinity, but also you know we, it, it's incredibly close to Oxford Street, which is the nation's high street, um, and just make it really an open and welcoming and inclusive. Um, and and like Dan was saying, reaching out um, uh, it, it, its tentacles far and wide to draw people in, so that they can enjoy this really wonderful green haven in the centre of our beautiful city. Amazing, thank you, Carol. Yeah, I I I love the idea of uh, the tentacles. I, I'd love to think that people from whichever part of South London would rock up and go and see what's going on in Grosvenor Square, not be put off and not think that there are barriers once they got off of public transport, which is only thirty people now in it on a bus. So it's like, how do you get there? Why would you want to entertain going over there? So that is that is the thing that I would be looking for for this space, this reimagined space to be. Let's go have a look at what they've got over there, and then we can demand exactly the same thing where we live. Because that's always been my feeling about absolutely everything since I was a small child. If you've got that there, I want the same build and quality where I live. I do absolutely don't care that I live on a housing estate. I do not want second, third, or fourth rate, rate treatment, and I want to know that there was some kid, male, female, non-binary, that's helped to design that space. So we can go, yeah, we're the next Fanny Wilkinson or whoever, we're the next pioneering person. And then we're gonna go and have a look at what they've done there, because that's gonna spur them on to be involved in landscape architecture or be like Dan and Ventura, because you've got to start somewhere. You know, it's yeah. got to encourage yeah. you and inspire you. And that's what I hope that this does. And it's not just, oh my God, not another square. And most of them are locked off any road. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. That's it. I hear you. Andrew. So just a couple of things, I suppose. Number one, I think a bit like the other contributors have said, um, 
I'll throw another statistic at you. It seems about half of the population are or use uh, used a green space in the last month. And you do wonder about the other half, what on earth are they doing? You know what I mean? So, so, so some of that data about how many people are using spaces, you can flip it and sort of say, well, hang on, well, why aren't the other 50% visiting green spaces? So trying to sort of encourage um, more use from these um, groups and individuals who, for whatever reason, seem reluctant to, to use um, uh, urban spaces. I suppose the second thing is about all these impromptu activities and things that maybe we don't often associate with being in parks. So I think over the last few weeks and months, um, people have been doing exercise in the park rather than in the gym, or they've been having their dance class in the park rather than in the community centre and, and these sorts of things. And it would be great if some of that continued and we might have to think about ways of managing and regulating that. I know in Charlton Park, near here you walk past some people, there's a, someone's having a ballet lesson and someone's, you know, all the things that used to be in indoor spaces are now in the park. And while some of those are going to return to indoor spaces it would be interesting to see which ones we'd like to keep and which ones we'd like to encourage to to remain yeah um so chivan what would be your big takeaway from this evening's conversation so um to be honest my biggest takeaway from this evening's conversation would be that i'm sort of really like keen to see what happens to, as as um someone said i'm really keen to see what happens to sort of as um, COVID-19 restrictions end and things start to go back to normal. How would things continue how they are? Um, would would certain like would people start going out more or would it go back to how people were? Would young people that like, would there be more people going out or would stuff that that is indoors activities as someone said would they stay in the park or would they go as which ones will stay in the park or just go back to being indoors? And yeah, the most the thing the most particular today is. I'm really sort of really keen to see what's going to happen. Mm. Just go back to normal. Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely really enjoyed that kind of performance of everyday life, like just where actually the stuff that's going on that I'm interested to gawp at out in public, it's just people going about their things. Like someone in my neighborhood was drying a massive tray of like a tomato paste outside. And you know, <laughs> someone else was, you know, was I'm there trying to like teach my daughter how to ride a bike, someone's playing with a ball. It's just interesting, isn't it? Like as humans, we're just, or is it just me? I'm fascinated by what other people are just doing in their lives. Um, Emily, finally, I'm coming to you. So I guess the first thing is a stat that um, Ben Smith, one of our trustees at National Park City Foundation taught me last week. One in seven children have not been to a park or green space in the last year. So they've not been with their parent or their guardian. So it builds on what Dan and what others have said so far. We have some green spaces, we have people using them, but what about those who aren't and how do we get them to be more inclusive? So if Grosvenor Square could do anything, it would be to inspire people that green, blue, however we want to describe them, rainbow spaces are going to be the most inclusive, the most welcoming, that they can function for different reasons, for different purposes. And I think the way to do that has to be through thoughtful design, engagement with the local community, but also others outside the local community, finding out what do people want this space in London to be? And if we've learned anything from the pandemic, it's that there are some voices that are not being heard. And so it's how do we get those voices and how do we understand what those barriers are? And can, can Grosvenor Square be a test bed to help overcome some of that? You know, could you have an education centre at the same time being event space that um, you know, young people would want to go to? Um, it is not a huge, it's not a huge space, it's not an enormous park, but it could be somewhere where you could test and do some really innovative things. So I think what I'd like to take away from the pandemic is that can we just try a few more things? Can we build up the business case that these spaces are not really green. They are part of our infrastructure and we need to make sure that we're using them, respecting them and investing in them to get the most out of them and the most for the communities as well. Amazing. Thank you, Emily. That's really great. I, I saw somebody in, um, in the chat saying that I need, oh, not me, but we all need like better, more words than just green. So thank you for using a, a different word to that. And also thank you to the person who told me that we're all nosy. Yes. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, panellists. Thank you for all the input and expertise. Uh, it's been wonderful to think about how we can incorporate that learning into 
and the future of, of Grosvenor Square, but also I'm sure for all of us to think about um, our own local There's lots of studies, articles and notes that I mentioned. Um, I'm going to suggest that we collect them all up and send them to the audience so people can refer to them if they wish to in a much more academic way than the way that I refer to them. If you're interested in finding out more about the Grosvenor Square project, I just want to share a few details. You can always follow us on Twitter or Instagram. The handles are up here. We've got um, some initial designs um, on display at the moment, both on live in Grosvenor Square and online. So we've collected together a set of community priorities um, through this engagement process. And we've got some initial design responses prepared by Tonkin Liu, who are leading, leading the redesign. So you, that's available until the 10th of August. You can meet the team in person on the 4th of August between 11 and two, if you want to talk to them or me um, in person. And there's more information on the website. So please do stay in touch so that we can bring together the best wisdom and knowledge to create something truly special in this iconic London Square. So thank you panel again, thank you audience, um, and have a lovely rest of evening, everybody.